edition of the COVID series organized by the SOAS Economics Department and the SOAS Open Economics Forum. I am here at Alexis Rudin and I'll be your moderator for the session. As the, as the session progresses, if you have any questions whilst the speaker is speaking, please put that in the chat box so that he can address them when he's done speaking. And uh, I will put the social media in case you want to follow up with what's happening for future events as well. And if you're going to tweet, please tweet with the hashtag co um, economics of COVID. Today's speaker is Dr. Nongo Sambasila, and he is a Senegalese development economist who is currently working as the program and research manager at the Rose, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Dakar. He is the co-author of the book, along with French journalist Fanny Pigot, type, titled Africa's Last Colonial Currency, the CFA Frank Story, which is stipulated to be released in February 2021. He's also the four-time world champion of French-speaking Scrabble. Along with that, he recently co-wrote an open letter with Amy Niang of Wits University and Lionel Zevenu to African leaders regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, and it has since been signed by over 100 intellectuals from both Africa and the, the diaspora. So welcome, Dr. Nango, and the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for their invitation. I am particularly honored to have such an opportunity uh, to speak about um, a topic uh, which could uh, help us understand better what happened during the last two decades. I have chosen a um, provocative title uh, somehow with religious tones um, to, uh, let's say, uh, try to make uh, people understand uh, what have happened during the last two decades. And um, I try to uh, justify the provocative title I choose uh, by proceeding in three steps. Uh, first, I'll give a short story of the African Rising narrative, which is also the narrative of emerging Africa. Uh, the second point uh, will be a critical economic assessment of the Africa rising era. Uh, and this era covers basically the last two decades. And my third point, uh, I will uh, draw some lessons about what the COVID-19 uh, retrospectively allows us to learn about the African Africa rising era. So I start by the, my first point, the story of the Africa rising narrative, brief story. The idea of the emergence of the African continent uh, probably appeared for the first time in 1957 in a report by Richard Nixon entitled The Emergence of Africa. Nixon then was the vice president of the United States and he had just completed an African tour during which he met a dozen political leaders, including Presidents Kwame Krumah of Ghana and Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt. Uh, the issue of this basic report was where would Africa then emerging from colonialism would go. And um, this document betrayed the fear that the so-called Soviet propaganda and the worrying situation of blacks in the United States would tip post-colonial Africa towards communism. So in this uh, uh, report, uh, Nixon made clear that we emerge from something, we emerge from somewhere. Africa was emerging from colonialism. However, when the financial institutions say the concept of emergence, uh, let's say uh, two decades later, uh, they uh, try in fact uh, to make it, let's say, sexier for investors because the term third world was not uh, really attractive to potential investors because of the image of po poverty which, with which it was associated. And so the new and appar apparently more dynamic concept of emerging markets was preferred in the early 1980s to the concept of third world. Uh, since then, the concept of emergence became a final destination for countries whose historicity now came down to the growth and profit profitability expectations of global finance. Uh, between 1918 and 2000, African countries was, were caught under the stronghold of the structural achievement plans of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank. 
and uh, during this period most of them did not belong to the category of emerging markets because the dominant narrative at that time uh, revolved around the myth that Africa was marginalized by the high speed trend of globalization. But ironically, the same institutions and actors who were developing this discourse tended to justify greater economic trade and financial liberalization. Uh, they started overnight and without any transition to praise emerging Africa, Africa rising, while the continent's economic fundamentals barely change. I will show um, a, a slide uh, illustrating uh, this uh, change of uh, narrative. Uh, it's uh, coming from the, the, the Economist, the newspaper. And you can see uh, in, a, in 2000, they were speaking about the hapless continent and 2011, they were now speaking about Africa rising. And uh, I am an uh, economist who was uh, alone in that move. There, is, there was also um, uh, McKinsey Global Institute, which spoke of lines on the move. And there was also the French Senate who published a, a report in 2013. Uh, the report was entitled, Africa is our future. When, when it is said Africa is our future, Africa is a future of French. That, that was the title of the report. And they were saying in this report, I quote, today we must address ourselves to an Africa that is fully integrated into globalization. So the question we might ask is what had changed to justify this change of narrative? In fact, after two decades of imposed austerity policies, uh, economic growth was again on the rise in the context of greater political stability due to a decline in political conflicts and a significant increase in prices of the continent's exports. The rapid expansion of trade and financial relations between African countries and China had also helped to shape the continent's image. Uh, the continent was suddenly seen as a pool of untapped resources and as a large and promising market for foreign companies dreaming of providing goods, services, and infrastructure to a young population that is expected to double every 25 to 30 years. The perception of an emerging Africa was first fueled by the rapid growth in the number of wealthy people. Between 2008 and 2012, uh, the number of Africans able to invest at least $1 million increased from 95,000 to 140,000. At the global level, following the financial crisis of 2008, the implementation of zero interest rate and quantitative easing policies by northern central banks created an abundance of capital for so-called emerging markets, which have become attractive because of the high returns they offer. Uh, many African countries would take the bait through the issuance of euro bonds, that is bonds dominated in foreign currency. The adoption of the African rising discourse by African countries themselves can be illustrated with the 14 countries using the CFA franc, which is the last colonial currency still circulating in Africa. Uh, of these 14 countries, only the Central African Republic, uh, which is a country facing uh, political instability, uh, only that country missed the opportunity to develop a plan or document with the word emergence in it. Burkina Faso proved to be more ambitious than the rest. Its president, Blaise Compaoré, said 2015 as the horizon for the emergence of its country. And at the end of October 2014, he was overthrown by a popular right, uh, uprising and he was evacuated by the French army to Cote d'Ivoire, uh, a country supposed to emerge this year, according to the promise made by its president, Alassane Ouattara. My own country, Senegal, also devised a plan emerging Senegal with the help of the McKinsey uh, Consulting Group. So this is, uh, in short, the, the story of the Africa rising. Now, in this second part, uh, I will try to critically assess uh, what has been the achievements during this uh, era, uh, which we could uh, date uh, symbolically between uh, 2000 and 2020. Uh, 2020 will be a year where Africa, according to the World Bank, will experience for the first time in 25 years, 
a recession. So for me, uh, this period 2020, the pandemic is the end of the Africa rising era. But what happened during this era? Uh, first, it is fair to say that uh, during these two decades, there was significant progress made in the education and health sector, sectors, as well as infrastructure building. Similarly, the middle class has expanded in some countries. Also, this is controversial due to, due to questionable definitions of what constitutes the middle class. But maybe the best argument for the Africa rising narrative is the high rates of economic growth observed during this period. The decade 2000-2010 was particularly impressive. Uh, in a sample of 49 countries out of 55 African countries, 12 had an average annual real GDP growth rate about 6%, and 18 countries had growth rates between 6% and 4%. Only nine countries had a growth rate less than 3%. The decade 2000 2010 was therefore the decade of Africa rising, the best decade ever so far for the continent. The commodity supper cycle explains why during this period, a country like Equatorial Guinea almost multiplied its real GDP by five in just a decade. But it does not explain everything. Countries such as Ethiopia and Rwanda, which are not hydrocarbon producers, were also able to double their real GDP over this decade. The following decade, uh, 2010 and now, was less dynamic than the previous one due to the end of the primary product supper cycle. But growth rates were still high. Also, they were decelerating. Growth in oil producing countries slowed down, but some non-oil producing countries, such as Ethiopia, Rwanda, Tanzania, picked up the pace. Compared to other regions, especially rich countries that are still struggling to recover from the global financial crisis of 2008, Africa's performance in terms of economic growth during the last two decades seems minor. But the question might ask, uh, should we do such kind of comparison? Is it heuristic to compare Ghana's growth rate, for example, to that of the United Kingdom? Or should we compare Africa's average growth rate over a given period to that of other regions? Uh, I would tend to say that when it comes to measure economic progress, real GDP growth rate is a very imperfect or even misleading indicator. Uh, beyond the statistical issue of the difficulties in measuring GDP, the fundamental issue is a theoretical one. GDP, a gross domestic product, measures different things in different economic structures. Analysts and economists rarely make the crucial distinction between and economic growth within an economic structure that still bears the colonial legacy and an economic growth within a modern economic structure. I would say, uh, basically, that economic growth in Africa during the Africa rising period was, in most cases, a colonial style economic growth. And the colonial style economic growth has three specificities. The first is its volatility. In a context, where countries are highly dependent on change in the terms of trade, on the global liquidity cycle, and sometimes countries are plagued by political conflicts, growth often has a dialectical nature. That means periods of contraction are followed by periods of sustained growth and vice versa. For example, Chad, which is an oil country, recorded an economic growth rate of 10.7% uh, per year between 2000 and 2010. Interestingly, this performance followed almost four lost decades. That means four decades in which real per capita income has been steadily declining. Another example, Zambia had achieved a growth rate of 7.4% per year between 2000 and 2010. And yet, by 2010, it has still not regained the highest level of real GDP per capita it achieved in 1967. The type of economic growth that consists of catching up on past poor performance concerned at least more than a third of African countries in the first decade of the Africa rising period. 
but there is a second characteristic to this colonial style economic growth. It's, it is its limited socioeconomic impact. The manufacturing sector has rarely been the engine of economic growth in Africa over the past two decades. This observation is also valid for countries that are less dependent of, on raw materials, such as Rwanda. More crucially, economic growth in Africa has been jobless. This means that jobs have been created mainly in the informal sector. If we take the case of Senegal, according to official sources, the informal sector was responsible for 99% of employment growth in the 2000s, while real GDP grew at an annual average of 4% per year. Between 2012 and 2018, the period that saw the launch of the plant emerging Senegal, the economy grew at an annual rate of 6%. But net job creation was negative in the modern sector. In other words, the modern sector has destroyed more jobs than it has created. The third characteristic of colonial style economic growth is its high financial cost, which is the corollary of its extractive nature. The two decades of Africa rising, and especially the first one, have undoubtedly been decades for foreign investors, especially those involved in the extractive industries. For example, the stock of inward foreign direct investment received by Sub-Saharan Africa has risen from less than 10% of GDP in 1999 to 40% of GDP in 2017. In extroverted and dependent countries like the majority of African countries, GDP is generally higher than GNI, gross national income. The difference between GDP, gross domestic product, and GNI, gross national income, is equal to the net transfer of income or the income balance. The difference is the income balance. And the income refers to profits and dividends transferred abroad, to interest on debt, and income of expatriate workers. Between 2000 and 2010, net income payment transferred in net terms by Africa to the rest of the world average 5% of its GDP. That is the highest proportion for all regions having a balance of income deficit. In comparative terms, over the same period, Africa's net income payments abroad totaled uh, $406 billion, three times more than the Eurozone, which also had a balance of income deficit. Maybe the African country that best illustrates the extractive nature of economic growth during this period is Equatorial Guinea, which is a former Spanish colony and also an oil exporting country. At the time, Equatorial Guinea was the richest African country. Also, its per capita income measured in pushes in power parity exceeded that of Greece at the time. Equatorial Equatorial Guinea was still classified as the least developed country. The richest African country at that time was ranked as the least developed country. How to explain that? This paradox may lie in the fact that Equatorial Guinea's net income payments to abroad averaged almost half of its GDP over the 2000, 2010 decade. That means its national income was on average less than half of production, the difference between the net income payments transferred abroad. Such financial buildings observable, observable in most oil producing African countries included a significant share of illicit financial flows, which according to some estimates were equivalent to $205 billion in the period between 2005 and 2010 alone. The revenues transferred by Africa to the rest of the world over the two decades have mostly taken the form of profit repatriations by freight investors. Progressive economies and civil society organizations often pay much more attention to the issue of public external debt than to profit repatriations by multinational corporations. This is unfortunate because uh, profit repatriations uh, bleed Africa far more than uh, debt servicing. I'll show you uh, a graph, 
derived from uh, an, artic an article uh, I co forward with Ingrid Kavan Graven from York University and Kai Kodenberg from Goethe University, Frankfurt. This graph shows that uh, cumulative debt service payments between 2000 and 2016 amounted to nearly 100 billion US dollars for 28 African countries representing 85% of Africa's GDP. This sum, this uh, 100 billion uh, US dollars is five times five time less than the cumulative profits from foreign debt investment over the same period because the cumul was uh, 500 billion US dollars transferred as a profit repatriation between 2000 and 2016, five times the interest paid uh, on external debt. So to conclude this second part, uh, the question you might ask, what really emerged during the Africa rising period? I would say basically three things. First, Ethiopia, uh, a very poor country, has fared very well with an average annual growth rate of almost 9% between 2000 and 2018. This has enabled it to increase its per capita income in net terms to nearly $772 in 2018. So it is a very poor country, despite the uh, huge rates of economic growth. The second thing that emerged uh, was that uh, there's, there has been an extractive boom. Uh, foreign investor profits have reached record levels. Uh, I had done in the past some, let's say, some calculations about the profits in some countries, for example, in Angola, uh, during this Africa rising era, the first uh, decade, you could see, for example, a rate of profit of 100% in a given year. The third thing that emerged, that rise, was also the external public debt of African countries, which has grown quickly during the last two decades. And especially after the 2008 financial crisis, the external debt of the continent has allowed the economic upturn to continue at a time when growth was slowing down. Uh, most importantly, uh, the debt owed to private creditors increased at an average annual rate of 10% between 2000 and 2008. And this is something really significant in the light of the discussions about the, the restructuring of the Africa's debt. You can see uh, here uh, a table with the um, state of play regarding Africa's debt. Uh, we could see that uh, in 2018, 42% of uh, the debt, external public debt of sub-Saharan Africa was held by private, private creditors uh, and essentially Eurobond holders. And um, what uh, the pandemic uh, made clear uh, in this circumstance is the unsustainability of this external debt-led growth model in the absence of any genuine structural transformation. The pandemic showed that the Africa rising narrative was to some extent another name for African external debt rising, and that's what we are living currently. Uh, this will be the third part of my presentation, third and last part of my presentation, what the COVID-19 revealed. At the beginning, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, so far, Africa has apparently been less affected than other regions for reasons that are not yet clear. Uh, yesterday, according to the Africa Center for Disease Control, the African continent as a whole had only uh, 100, 197,000 cases of infection, uh, including less than uh, 6,000 deaths. Northern and Southern Africa are the most affected regions. Uh, the fact that Africa was the last region to be affected, which gave it some time to prepare itself, um, the experience of the African health authorities in emerging pandemics, the usefulness of the populations, and the climatic factor can no doubt explain partly 
why the health impact of COVID-19 has been minor so far. This being said, it should also be pointed out that mortality statistics are very unreliable in Africa. According to the Economic Commission for Africa, only four African countries, Egypt, Mauritius, Seychelles, and South Africa, have a statistical monitoring system for births and deaths that meets international standards. So we have to yeah, be uh, cautious regarding, let's say, the figures sometimes. However, on the economic front, Africa has not been spared. According to the World Bank, the continent is expected to experience its first recession in 25 years, that means since 1995. And one of the first manifestations of the COVID-19 pandemic was a drastic drop in the prices of raw materials exported by African countries. Together with the closure of borders, this had led to a drop in export and tax revenues, the depreciation of currency values, and in some cases, such as in South Africa, a significant capital flight. Remittances from international migrants have also declined. As the capacity to service external debt declined, access to capital markets became highly costly, costly for sovereign bond issuers. So it comes as no surprise that most African countries have so far found it difficult to respond to the health and economic challenge. There are many economic lessons to be learned from the pandemic, but here I would like uh, to draw attention to three major weakness, weaknesses that the pandemic revealed. The first is the unequal nature of the economic model of the Africa rising period. Uh, this economic model did not have a lasting impact on the living conditions of the populations, especially those living in rural areas and those working in the urban informal sector. In Senegal, for example, which is not the most extreme case, official survey data showed that nearly 52% of real households had no access to soap and water in 2017. Also, urban areas normally have access to safe drinking water sources. There are frequent interruptions. Few African countries have tried to implement total lockdown in that circumstances. Uh, in rural areas, a lockdown strategy is often impractical because densities are low and the presence of the state is almost imperceptible. In urban areas, a, local, a lockdown strategy is doomed to failure for financial and administrative reasons. States have neither the means to achieve this lockdown nor the appropriate instruments to help the most deprived. A lockdown in the case of the informal sector workers who often accounts for more than 70% of urban employment, exposes them to promiscuity and hunger. Between dying of hunger and dying of the coronavirus, the choice was quickly made in favor of the later dying, of course. A recent study published by Unowider, entitled Africa's Lockdown Death Dilemma, defined a lockdown readiness index. And this index was based on five components. Access to safe drinking water, basic sanitation, a source of reliable energy, a means of information or communication, and last but not least, a form of employment that provides sufficient income, not to go without cash on a frequent basis. For a sample of 30 African countries, the index revealed based on uh, 2019 data that less than two in 10 urban households and less than one in 10 real households across South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa are fully ready for a prolonged lockdown. So uh, African governments were aware of their financial limitations. That's why they have generally opted for curfews and selective bans on certain economic and social activities uh, requiring gatherings, such as uh, bars, restaurants, schools, mosques, and sometimes interregional transport. But even such restrictions are not financially and socially sustainable. In many African countries, governments have had to gradually relax such restrictive measures following strict process, strict, strict, strict protest. The second weakness revealed by the pandemic is that the Africa rising period did not significantly increase the fiscal capabilities of most African government. The tax to GDP, uh, GDP ratio is at low levels in many uh, cases. Um, 
I have a table there. Um, yeah, it's a graph. And in this graph, you could see that uh, uh, the two champions of the Africa rising period, Equatorial Guinea and Ethiopia, have very low levels of tax to GDP ratio. For Equatorial Guinea, it's 6.1% and uh, it is a uh, set point five percent for ethiopia uh, the data come from the world bank uh, we could say that yeah these figures are probably underestimated but the basic fact is that the tax to gdp ratio is very low in most african countries and under such uh, conditions uh, even the implementation of unorthodox monetary policies would quickly find its limits in the inability of governments to tax the economy properly. Uh, official development assistance and debt in foreign currency, especially to pay for essential imports, then become unavoidable alternatives as a demand for external debt restructuring. Thus, on the April 13th, the IMF granted debt relief to 19 African countries and has so far lent uh, 9.8 billion US dollars to 28 African countries. 45% of this amount has been pocketed by two countries, Nigeria and Ghana. The IMF has also called for the suspension of the bilateral debt service. In April, the Paris Club accepted to freeze debt services for 75, 77 countries. As for now, only 12 countries have received debt relief, including lately Ethiopia, the growth superstar, uh, Congo Republic, and chat. However, the thorny issue of uh, public external debt owed to private creditors remains unresolved. The third weakness revealed by the pandemic is that for an increasing number of African countries, the external debt left growth is no longer financially and socially sustainable. A recent uh, report by the G Jubilee Debt Campaign uh, gave very interesting uh, figures about the share of uh, spending dedicated to, uh, to external debt servicing compared to the public spending, public spending in the health sector. Uh, in the 2019, in Angola, for example, debt servicing accounted for 42.6% of office tax revenue compared to only 6.5% for public health expenditure. And uh, yeah, there are 32 countries currently for which debt service is higher than spending on health expenditure. So in light of these various facts, it can be safely inferred that the continent's ability to successfully weather the COVID-19 pandemic will depend to a large extent on the treatment of its external debt on the short run, it will be necessary to restructure it in a way that preserves output and employment on the lines advocated by former IMF economist Peter Doyle with his preemptive survey insolvency regime proposal. This will be a tough fight as private creditors will resist, but African countries and their partners must go against the IMF's pro-creditor bias and demand the abolition of sovereign debtors prisons through proposals such as a preemptive sovereign insolvency regime. But more importantly, it is time to realize that Africa's debt issue is a symptom of the inadequacy of its development model, that same extroverted development model advocated for her by the Bretton Woods institutions and the rich countries. As long as this development model is maintained, the external debt issue will come to the fore every uh, 15 to 20 years because there is no long-term financial fix for Africa's external debt problem. The real solutions require the achievement of more economic and monetary sovereignty by African countries individually and collectively, as well as a global economic system more favorable to developing countries, which allow them more space to develop and to implement industrial policies. So in conclusion, I would say that the COVID-19 pandemic puts an end to the Africa rising era. 
but it ushers in a period of transition from which it is difficult to say where it will, where it will lead. The only certainty is that the future is full of potential. This means that, provided we are bold enough, it is possible to save this crisis as an opportunity to set Africa and the world on the trajectory of a new civilization of abundance, equality, and respect for ecological limits. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions, but the first one is, would it be possible for us to get like um, a list of resources so we can so they can be made public for people who are wondering? Uh, excuse me. Oh, I was uh, the first question. We get like a list of resources for people who are wondering that you use for the presentation, so people could read. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I. I, I, I yeah, okay, thank you. Very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the questions that was raised was what you think would happen to major African oil, ex uh, major oil exporting African nations with implement implementation of green economics and the push for more sustainable source of, sources of energy? How do you yes. think? Yeah. I did not hear you. Very well. Sorry. Um, what do you think would happen to major African oil exporting countries with the push? for green economics and more sustainable sources of energy. Yeah, I think that's a necessary transition. African countries have to do their best to move from fossil fuels for a more renewable source of energy. And uh, we see that with the pandemic, their currency strongly depreciated. And uh, yeah, their external debt level have also uh, rise a lot. Uh, and uh, generally, as I have tried to uh, uh, show in my presentation, the oil income has not necessarily been beneficial to African populations. So we have to find another type of model less dependent on extractive industries. Okay. So, okay. then, I'm like, what do you? You're welcome, Richard. Um, what solutions would you then suggest? for African countries to disconnect from private capital funding. How do you think? Yeah, uh, we, we have a number of African economists. Uh, we uh, think that Africa needs more economic and monetary sovereignty. When we say more economic sovereignty, we mean more control on, on, the, on the economic resources of the continent and also on the policies uh, implemented in the continent to delink from the type of uh, neoliberal policy uh, framework advocated by the World Bank, the IMF, and so on. But at the same time, we need also more monetary sovereignty. We know that monetary sovereignty is a spectrum, but uh, African countries have to do their best to finance their development in local currency. So this is something really important because uh, uh, when you are entered in foreign currency, as a country, you could not say that you are really independent at a political level. So foreign debt is always a, um, an, uh, an, an issue. Uh, that's the same for foreign debt investment. Foreign debt investment is not, is not bad in itself, but the type of foreign debt investment we have in Africa is strongly located in the extractive sectors. So we have to try to have foreign debt investment which increases our domestic capacities and enlarge our domestic markets and also is associated with technological transfers. Uh, in this condition, foreign debt investment could be beneficial for African countries. Yeah, I remember um, President Nana of Ghana saying something similar in a recent conversation. But would you think that the African continental free trade area would likely have a, any significant effect on development in Africa? Yeah, my own take on that is that the African continental free trade area would just increase the, the inequalities, the disparities we have. Because historically speaking, free trade is a doctrine for, let's say, developed industrial countries. In Africa, you don't have industrial powerhouses, maybe South Africa, but you don't have industrial powerhouses. Most of them are uh, producers of raw materials. So how could they benefit from free trade? I am not ad ad advocating, let's say, the closure of borders, 
But what I'm saying is that um, it, we could uh, have alternative kinds of economic and trade integration. For example, instead of uh, putting in competition agricultural uh, producers, we could try to have a common agricultural policy so that we guarantee them an income and we uh, make sure that the agricultural productivity will rise. We could also uh, design mechanisms such as um, Africa could have, a, let's say, um, continental payment systems which will help uh, facilitate trade between African countries because they have, uh, yeah, the fact that there, there, there is a, a plurality of currencies uh, that, that do not necessarily uh, facilitate trade. So there are many things we could do to uh, facilitate trade, but I don't think that the type of uh, um, uh, free trade logic behind the African continental free trade area will not work. And I would say that there is one, one, one basic study which has been done about the African continental free trade area. And you know that generally uh, two basic assumptions uh, behind these free, free trade uh, models is that you have full employment and all the uh, exchange rates are flexible. So you make a study simulating the effects, probable effects of the African continental free trade area, and you assume all the relevant problems by saying that there is no employment problem, Africa is on full employment, there is no underemployment, etc. And from there, trade will increase. So I think this is not uh, the best approach. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Lee saying, is there a way to limit net income transfers during the next resource boom while still retaining investment and business given the weak governance institutions in countries, Western African countries? Yeah, in fact, to, to, to limit that, uh, at least there are three things to do. Uh, first, uh, the debt, external debt, uh, yeah, uh, the growth of the external debt uh, should be slowed down because among the net income transfer, there are the interest uh, payment on external debt. So we have to slow down the debt, the debt service. The second thing is that when you do not have enough uh, economic sovereignty, sovereignty in your, on your resources, you do not really benefit from your resources. So Africa needs more sovereignty on its resources. And the third thing is that we need to tax more, uh, let's say, uh, foreign companies. And there are many civil, civil society organizations like uh, uh, Tax Justice Network in Africa uh, working so that there is a greater um, accountability by, uh, by transnationals because we know that uh, uh, the bulk of the illicit financial flows uh, goes through the, let's say, trade misprice, mispricing of uh, multinationals. So th those are um, three, uh, let's say, um, things we have to try to do if we want to um, limit to some extent, extent the, the net income payments to, to abroad. Thank you. Speaking of sovereignty, uh, there's a question asking from Fatima. Uh, how do you how you th how you would prescribe that African countries set up their country uh, their currencies without facing any backlash from Bretton Woods institutions and in the international community? I did not understand. I'm sorry. How do you think African countries can set up their currencies without facing backlash from Bretton Woods institutions and the international community? Yeah, I think except for the C eight eight nine countries. Uh, which are still using a colonial currency, most of the yeah, countries use freely their, 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 their currency and their exchange rate uh, uh, yeah, evolves depending uh, on the um, economic cycle. Uh, for example, with the pandemics, we have seen that for uh, most uh, uh, oil exporting countries, uh, exchange rates have, have depreciated a lot. I think somehow the um, the value of the currency is linked also to the economic performances of, of countries. Now we have another question. Is they're asking, or they're saying, the price of rice broke through the $20 level for the first time since 2008. How do you think this will affect Senegal's poorest households, especially in rural areas? 
has the structure created a class of capitalists who benefit from having exclusive import licenses coming from their friends in government, like in Nigeria with Dangote, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be very uh, for most households, not only rural households, but also urban households, because uh, Senegalese are really dependent on rice for their daily consumption. And uh, we produce locally our rice, but most of rice come, comes from Asia, from, from Asia. And uh, now uh, it's beginning, beginning to be very difficult. I just give one example. Uh, we are in the pandemic and our foreign exchange reserves are limited. Our government want to help the poorest. And what did our government do? Senegal's government, uh, he took the limited foreign exchange we have to import rice from Asia and took that rice to distribute it to the poor households. Whereas we have local producers able to produce rice. So you see, we are losing on production and we are losing on foreign exchange rate. So when the price of rice will go up, it will be uh, very difficult for us on financial terms for the state, but also for the households, rural and urban. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Daniela asking, what kind of developmental model would you like to see for African countries? And what national political shifts are necessary to gener generate ideological purchase amongst domestic elites? Yeah, I, I will say we, we need a um, selective uh, delinking. Uh, delink delinking in the sense of uh, going more towards uh, economic and monetary sovereignty. When I say delinking, I am not for autarky. For me, delinking is a middle ground between autarky and also uh, strong integration in the world economy. For me, we have to have a middle ground. And middle ground means that uh, we are prioritizing the interests of the populations. But we know that in economic development, uh, that uh, often the problem is not technical. It's not the solutions. Because even if we don't have the solutions, uh, at least we know what we should not do. But the issue is sometimes you have powerful vested interests which are against genuine change, which could benefit the masses. So I think that the basic uh, issue is how do we change the type of uh, political structures we have in our countries in Africa. That is the basic thing. We need uh, somehow a kind of democratic revolution that will be the basis of any uh, genuine economic change in the continent, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then along with that, is there, do you, believe that there's a real South South development model for African countries? And if you do, what do you, what do you think it looks like? Yeah, uh, did, this could be done. For example, we could have monetary agreements between African countries. We could also have uh, trade agreements and investment agreements, which will not be based, let's say, on the logic of competition, but mostly on emulation and complementarity. But for now, this is not the kind of South-South development model we have. Our uh, cooperation is China. Maybe in Africa, give us, uh, let's say, some alternative vis-a-vis -vis the, the Western uh, type of partnership. But it is more or less the same old patterns maintaining Africa in primary specialization. And that's not good for Africa. And I was saying that within the framework of the free trade area is the powerful countries the powerful companies which will benefit from this area and not necessarily the, the poorest countries which lacks the basics to, to, to be able to, to benefit from such an initiative. Do you think from this experience of the COVID-19, uh, do you think that it would encourage African countries to rely on their own internal resources as opposed to importing excessive amounts from abroad? Yeah, now many, uh, many um, African governments realize the need to delink a bit. That means producing domestically what could be produced, including even uh, health, uh, uh, health products. So many African countries realize that. But the issue is that will they have the fiscal space? Will they have, let's say, the financial space to do that? Uh, because we are living in a period of transition and we know that this external debt issue will 
may uh, hamper any prospect of genuine recovery. So depending on how we handle this uh, hot external debt issue, maybe uh, this could, let's say, um, help African countries take another direction, trying to promote what could be uh, uh, produced uh, domestically. We have also to say that uh, most African countries are not uh, integrated, let's say, nationally. Or for example, in Senegal, there are things that are pro agricultural products that are produced in the south. Uh, yeah, but they get rotten in the south because there is not enough uh, infrastructures to bring those agricultural products to the richer regions like Dakar, etc. So before talking of uh, free trade, of continental integration, countries in themselves have to be integrated. Okay, thank you. Um, another one from Lee. Do you think defaulting on privately held debt is a viable solution for African countries facing a top and fiscal environment as a result of the pandemic? I think what, what the pandemic has revealed is that this is not sustainable at all. We could not rely on um, private uh, debt. Uh, yeah, because when you have uh, uh, some difficulties due to the economic cycle, you see that this is a debt which a form of debt which is not easy to restructure because we know that the private creditors would not be let's say cooperative to that end if it's debt uh, towards uh, bilateral partners or multilateral institutions things might be might, might be done that let's say um, provide some relief to, to african countries so i think that we have to do our best to limit our exposure to financial markets. And given also the fact that uh, generally the type of um, um, debt, private debt, the euro bonds we issued, generally have served to finance infrastructures that have not been uh, useful for the majority of populations. So in some way, it's just a form of uh, taking debt to, yeah, to enrich some corporations and uh, a minority among the African elites. That has been more or less the basic story of uh, Africa rising. Many infrastructure have been built, but uh, in fact, infrastructures which have been overpriced and uh, infrastructures uh, um, which do not benefit the majority of the populations. Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier on that uh, a lot of the African countries couldn't afford to have lockdowns because of the you know, very poor communities and a he very heavily informal economy. Um, how do you think that, go moving on from this, the informal economy can be included in future models and be taken into account? Yeah, uh, generally people tend to have some people, a romantic idea about the informal sector. That's true, the vibrant sector. It's a, uh, yeah, uh, resourceful sector but it is also the product of capitalism. It is the, the size of the informal sector is illustrative of the disarticulated nature of, let's say, countries of the global south. There is no, the, they, you don't find the, let's say, the intersectoral linkages between the sector. And this, is, this has been a legacy of colonialism, which explains to some extent the size of the informal sector. Yes, uh, during the 1980s with the sector adjustment plan, the informal sector boomed because we know there was a context of uh, austerity and also layoffs in the public sector, etc. And um, this also accounted for the boom of the informal sector. So I think um, what we need is to develop uh, the agriculture, agricultural sector, peasant agriculture, because most of the uh, workers in the urban informal sector, they have been released from, uh, from the agricultural sector and normally, uh, the agricultural sector, yeah, before releasing such kind of uh, manca manpower, should have attained a certain level of development. This is not the case in Africa. Those are, uh, let's say, uh, absorbed by the uh, urban sector uh, because the agricultural sector is um, is declining or is still uh, in a low pro pro low productivity trap. So I think we must develop the agricultural sector and at the same time try to have um, policies which are uh, designed to create uh, jobs in uh, labor in intensive sectors so basically manufacture and that is important to to have such kind of uh, perspective but this is this has not been the perspective of african states 
with these uh, free trade uh, policies, uh, etc., this uh, neoliberal agenda. Okay. Does anyone just wanted to ask? Does anyone have any question just to squeeze in for the last minute? Could you, uh, Dr. Ndongo, could you please just give us a quick, a brief, like uh, a wrap up or a final statement or comment? Yeah, I, I the Africa Rising narrative uh, was initially built uh, from abroad to say that now uh, Africa is the last frontier of capitalist expansion. There are markets there is economic dynamism, and we could make profit. And we achieved uh, high rates of economic growth, but those economic growth did not benefit the majority of the population. Uh, those economic growth did not improve the fiscal capabilities of the states. Those economic uh, growth uh, relied uh, to some extent, especially uh, after the uh, great financial crisis on private debt. And that uh, trend is not sustainable. So uh, the end of the Africa rising brought by the pandemic could be an opportunity to think about other type of heterodox policies uh, towards delinking selectively from the global economy. When I say delinking, it's not autarky. It's the middle ground between autarky and the type of, let's say, neoliberal integration we had uh, um, towards the, the global economy. So basically, thank you very much for that, Dr. Ndongo. Um, we really appreciate you coming on here to talk about the African Rising narrative. Um, for everyone who's still on, thank you for coming in. I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did. On this fifth, uh, on the fifteenth of June, we have the next session on inequalities in the fiscal stance in the COVID-19 era, era, and on the 17th, we have the COVID-19 and the great lockdown. Same time, same place. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody, thank you.